Today's panel, of course, is chronicling the emergence in the early 1980s of a new technology and a new company, MIPS Technologies, and the use of reduced instruction set computing, uh, revolutionary as they were and the people who did it. We're very fortunate to have the panel with us today. I want to introduce the chairman of our semi-sig group, Dave House, who is going to come to the stage along with the panel, and they will introduce themselves. Thanks, everyone. Well, welcome, everybody. This, uh, we're going to try in the next 40 minutes to give you a complete summary of four to five hours worth of videotaping that's been done with four different sessions, uh, one that handled the uh, early years of MIPS, one that ha handled after the IPO uh, time frame. And uh, so we'll then open it up for questions at the end of the, the uh, time. Let's start out, one minute each. I'd like to hear from each of you where you grew up, where you went to college, the jobs you had before MIPS, and your primary job at MIPS. You want to start, Skip? Sure, sure. I'm Skip Struder. I grew up in the East Coast, Boston. I went to Dartmouth College, where we had, when I was there, one computer. <laughs> but I got to use that computer hands-on. Um, then I went to Stanford, computer science program, PhD. And when I finished Stanford, I was very fortunate to get a job at Motorola. So I was doing, um, I caught on with the chip design team that became the 68,000 down in, uh, in Texas, and uh, was fortunate to be part of that really wonderful program. I think I've heard about that. Person. Yeah, yeah we, we were trying to um, <laughs> knock out some of your market share, Dave, at Intel. Um, and then I came back to Silicon Valley, had to, had to be back in Silicon Valley, and I got together with uh, John and John Maceris. And Great. Bob? Nips. Uh, my name's Bob Miller. I grew up in New York, on Long Island to be specific. Uh, prior to Long Island, Brooklyn, because that turns out to be important. I went to uh, school at Bucknell University. It turned out John and I grew up within about 10 miles of each other. Um, went to Bucknell, got a degree in engineering. We had two computers. <laughs> Not better than that. Uh, came to graduate school at Stanford. When I finished there, uh, I went to work at IBM. I was at IBM 15 years. And during that time, which is going to be relevant to this discussion, uh, I was responsible for the microprocessor strategy at IBM. Then I uh, went to Data General to be a senior executive there, and then was recruited to MIPS by Skip and, and uh, John. And uh, I was the CEO of MIPS. Hey, John. John Hennessy, uh, born in New York City, but grew up like Bob on mostly on Long Island. Went to Villanova for my undergraduate degree in double E, and then Stony Brook for my PhD in computer science. Uh, came to Stanford in 1977 as an assistant professor. Um, did what assistant professors normally do, working with students, research. Um, got involved with uh, Jim Clark and the geometry engine, Silicon Graphics, and that was my first actually startup experience, and then went on to do MIPS after that. Cool. I'm Joe Danucci. I was born in Pittsburgh. I skipped the growing up part. Um, <laughs> I went to Carnegie Tech the last year before it became Carnegie Mellon. I had a mechanical engineering major. Uh, there was no computers. Um, we actually had to do mechanical drawing in ink. Um, no exaggeration. I did earn an MBA at Duquesne University. I distinguished that I have one. I'm not one. Um, and uh, I worked for digital for a long time, for 17 years, and uh, from 1972, when the PDP-11 was launched, through 1989, when we launched the MIPS-powered workstation line. That's another story. Um, I got to MIPS uh, by uh, pitching to Bob Miller that MIPS could do anything, but it couldn't do everything. And maybe I could follow him around and figure out which of his brilliant ideas that tossed off every 10 minutes could be executed. So he actually gave me that job, Vice President of Strategy Development, much to the consternation of various incumbent Vice Presidents. And uh, it was a lot of fun. I, I have never worked so hard or had so much fun and uh, learned so much in such a short time. I should mention I'm Dave House, and I'm not part of the team, and I was not at MIPS, but I spent 23 years at Intel and had the pleasure of competing with these guys, and so it's been <laughs> great to get together and compare uh, Every stories. Every time I was on a panel at some conference or something about semiconductors, Dave was on the same panel. <laughs> <laughs> Opposite sides. Yeah. So, Skip, uh, 1984, 27 years ago, ah, the world was a different place. It's hard can to you, remember. Can you just sort of set the context yes, for the, 
the time period when it, it, I think it's, it's, it's useful to do that. So um, 1984, um, PCs had been around for seven or more years. Uh, the state of the art was your Intel 286, right? 12 and a half megahertz. Oh, that was um, a beauty. Yeah. <laughs> um, you could buy an IBM PC uh, called the AT. It was the, the latest, hottest thing. Um, IBM also I, I was looking, announced a portable in 1984. Portable PC, it weighed 30 pounds. Mm -hmm. and so that, that's where we were. Um, the industry was starting to change. There was a, a new part of the industry called workstations. So Sun Microsystems, Apollo, and HP and others were doing workstations, generally using 16-bit architecture, like a 68,000s. Um, and that was very interesting, starting to coalesce around Unix as a, a common operating system instead of proprietary operating systems on, on different chips. The software was relatively unsophisticated. The compilers were very simple. APIs were not standardized. So the idea of software portability was really not uh, very available. One key factor at that time was VLSI design. Um, Carver Mead and Lynn Conway had written the book. It was a text, standard textbook and courses like I'm sure John Hennessy taught at Stanford. And more, it, more and more people had access to thinking about VLSI design and actually making chips in the university like the MIPS chip uh, with the Moses Fab. So that was a very important kind of change point in, in the industry and the uh, engineering capabilities. In those days, when I was at Motorola, it, instruction set design was generally concerned with two things. Backward compatibility, you had to make, try to run the old programs on your, on your new things, which means you brought along the you know, glitches and, and um, features, uh, features <laughs> yeah, of the old generation that were, were there because of hardware and technology limitations, not necessarily because they were good architecture. Right? Mm -hmm. um, um, <clears throat> and the general trend was to depend on the hardware to add more and more complex instructions to make writing software easier. Mm -hmm. Compilers were not very sophisticated, except in the labs, in John Hennessy's lab in particular. But it was time for a change. We needed to go from 16-bit to 32-bit. And we needed, in particular, the opportunity was there, which is what RISC is all about, is to redefine the instruction sets for, <coughs> instead of these other uh, constraints, redefine the instruction set for fast execution. And that's really what the basic concept of RISC is. And John was at Stanford doing uh, RISC. Yeah, so before 1984, time. John, you were doing some stuff. Tell us about the early work that led up the pre-formation of the company work. Well, we, we um, had, after the geometry engine was done and Jim Clark had spun out Silicon Graphics, the group that was doing VLSI research said, well, let's get together. What should we do next? So we thought, well, we've got a compiler group. We had actually started a major compiler project uh, back actually to support the S1 project at Lawrence Livermore. Uh, so we had a very good compiler group um, at Stanford. And we took a look at thinking about doing a processor. And the first thing that came to mind as well, we want to do a 32-bit processor. We want to <coughs> begin to move microprocessors towards being real computers as opposed to people, something people think in a different space. So that will mean limiting some of what we need to put on there. We need to think about the limitations of being on a single piece of silicon. But I think we also thought um, we want something that's a target for a compiler. Some of you will remember that. Remember the instruction set count wars that went on between mm -hmm. Zilog and Intel, where <laughs> you would add three new instructions and claim this was better, even if nobody ever used them, and certainly <laughs> only very clever assembly language programmers ever used them. Um, so we thought very much about a compiler perspective. And I think one of the things that early on influenced our ideas were, if you look at what, would ha what was happening, as Skip said, more and more instructions, more and more microcode translation. Well, of course, the problem with that is every time you pick up an instruction, you retranslate it to microcode. We thought the compiler can do that, and it can do it once per program, not once every time the instruction is executed. So that was a big motivation for us in thinking about Rather than building microcode up to the level of the compiler, we would take the compiler down to the level of hardware. And like the, the IBM project was really our kin, although very little was known about it. The IBM project was kept quite quiet. They didn't publish anything early on. 
and many of John Cox's visits to the West Coast only happened after the projects at Stanford and Berkeley had actually published. And of course, then the project at Berkeley, which um, relied certainly on the same principles of simplification, load store architecture, single cycle execution, but without the use of a lot of compiler technology. And in fact, their register windows came from exactly that kind of belief that they didn't know how to do the compiler <coughs> technology. So that was the beginning, and you know, we did our paper, did our, and we were, we were then good little students and faculty members. We published our papers, and we assumed this is such an obviously good idea that the industry will pick it up. <laughs> uh, well, now I'll turn it over to Skip to talk about what happened next. Um, so, so Skip, uh, you've uh, done the 68,000, so you're well established. You left Motorola, you're up here in the valley, and uh, so how did, uh, how did the three of you get together? So we had, I had my um, you know, successful commercial chip development background. John had been working at um, Stanford, as he mentioned, and very interesting new ideas <coughs> and ready to make a real chip. And then uh, the third member of the founding team was John Maceres. I don't know if he's here today or not. Um, John had, was from IBM. He had <coughs> worked on, with John Cock on the 801 project, which is the risk uh, design that, that John was referring to. And he was taking a year uh, on assignment at Stanford. So we were all together with research background, academic background, commercial background, within uh, you know, five miles of each other at Stanford, except we didn't really know about each other. The breakthrough introduction came from Gordon Bell, interestingly enough. Gordon, Gordon's always in these histories at some point. The little thread. Uh, yeah, he's, he's always here. <laughs> Weaves its way through. But Gordon wanted to start a new company called Encore. Um, and he had some interesting ideas about company structure and stuff. That actually mm -hmm. never flew, but he did introduce us. He encouraged us. He wanted us to come to Encore and be the, the CPU design Encore. team there. Um, that didn't quite work and didn't quite meet our model, but it catalyzed us getting together and thinking about starting a company. So 1984, the company. So 1984, uh, gets mostly it's spring and summer. We got together. We had breakfast every day at uh, a restaurant that's they closed it now. We should have bought it, I guess, in <laughs> town and country village across from Stanford. And um, the ideas gradually progressed. We um, eventually got to the point where we went to see the VCs. We were up and down Sand Hill Road, classical thing, talked to all the, I mean, some really terrific companies. We had some good discussions and bad discussions, some contentious, lots of uh, um, parking lot meetings after discussions with VCs trying to sort out what they were saying and where they were trying to pull us. In the end, though, we, we decided to work with the Mayfield Fund. Grant Heydrich and Gib Myers were our sponsors at Mayfield. And in October, I think it was, 1984, we signed a, you know, our first Series A stock. We sold whatever portion of the company it was, I can't remember, for a million and a half dollars. Great. So the first thing we did with, because <laughs> I was the, among other things, the CFO <laughs> by, uh, by, by default, I think. So we got a million and a half dollars in the bank. The next day, I wrote a check to DEC for $500,000 for a VAX, because that's what you had to do to, to build a company. Yep. <laughs> so, so um, John, you uh, take a sabbatical at this time. Yes, so I took a sabbatical from Stanford, and I had the illustrious title of chief scientist, which means you can make great pronouncements without having to worry about what anybody's actually doing at the company. Um, and uh, we started beginning, we, we began then to start to hire people, I think, <clears throat> building out the compiler team hiring Larry Weber to run it and Fred Chow, who'd been my student at Stanford and had done uh, most of the compiler technology uh, that we had developed at Stanford. Um, John Mashey to really lead our systems, operating systems group in particular, uh, and then really build out the VLSI side of the team. Les Cordell, who'd worked on the 68,000 with Skip came, and Ed Hudson, who'd been at Intel for many years came, and we really began to build out the breadth of the company. I think um, a key thing early on was to decide what we were going to save and what we were going to throw away from the MIPS design at Stanford. And in the end, we decided it was time to switch to CMOS. So that was the first big de decision, NMOS versus CMOS. But I think we, we correctly saw that NMOS was coming to the end of its lifetime and that CMOS was the future. So we made the switch. Once we made the switch, it was clear that we were going to keep relatively little of the Stanford design, so we then asked the question, I think heavily influenced by John Massey's um, thoughts about Unix and how to best run Unix, 
uh, we redesigned the, using the same principles, single cycle execution. We expanded the register set, um, put in byte addressing as opposed to just word addressing, a few other things which were important we had for told compatibility. The, we had told the VCs that we would just implement yeah, the Stanford chip them. and it would get done really quickly and yeah. inexpensively. But so we, 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 we did tell that. them we could do it inexpensively. Um, <laughs> Well, you know, it, it, you should see this business plan. There's no mention of market, how big it is, what you could sell things for. All there are a bunch of performance graphs that show this is a lot faster than anything else out there, how much money we need, and what our schedule might look like. We had like. a wonderful tagline, though, and I think I can attribute it to John Hennessy. It's uh, mini computer performance for microprocessor prices. Yeah, yeah. So that was, that was kind of the goal, and I think we put the team together. Um, and spent a lot of the early time building the team and then really building out the core architecture and deciding what we were going to do and getting going on the implementation. There's, there's one key part about that that I wanted to mention. Sure. Um, um, guys like Mashi and Larry Weber understood this, but um, we had ideas about an architecture and we wanted it to run software right, but we didn't have a chip. You know, this is a year before the, the chip was out. So we, we, had, we put together a software simulator that was really key. Every time the architects wanted to think about a change in the architecture, you could change the simulator, run the code, or, you know, boot Unix on the simulator, and see the effect of those changes. So oh. it's really a marvelous way to design architecture. So what's really cool about the simulator is the way it worked is it translated um, MIPS instructions into instructions on the VAX. Nice. And so the code could run in native form, which means we could debug co the really compiler, we could run large programs, and we actually ended up bootstrapping the operating system on top of this thing. So it, it really cut down the normal delay that occurs once you get a piece of hardware back, and then you really can begin debugging the software. Well, we could compress that a lot by doing Fantastic. that. Yeah. So you got the uh, MIPS 2000, it's a CMOS chip, but you don't have a wafer fab. What happens next, Skip? Yeah, well, uh, that, that was interesting too. We, the idea of a fab, you know, TSMC wasn't even founded yet. You know, the idea that you just send your chip design, except for Moses, which was restricted and um, not very advanced technology, but for universities. Um, but we went around, we, we talked to, uh, VLSI technology was starting at that time, and I knew those guys from, from Motorola. Um, Bayman Crane was our president, had worked at Sperry and, and knew about um, Sperry fab. And so we, we had those, I can't remember if LSI Logic was in the group at that time or not, but we had a few uh, places where we could send the chip. Um, during the chip development, sometime in the middle of 1985, we wrote a contract with Prime Computer. And the contract was, was it a million and a half dollars or a yeah, million dollars? So. Um, if we could deliver a working board before the end of 1985 to Prime. So that's 14 months after we founded the company. We were supposed to deliver a working chip with, on a board that they, they could test. And frankly, that money was necessary to keep the company afloat. So we had to, had to win this contract. You had to get that one half right, million yeah. dollars. So, you know, we, John can tell more about it. We, we uh, did the design. We, we um, taped it out in November. It's due in December. And okay. it was fabbed where? Well, we sent it to those places that I mentioned. And John Maceres had wow. met the guys from Sierra Semiconductor. He wasn't really on the map at the time, but he liked what he saw there. And um, the board was all set, and the management was all set with these other, quote, semiconductor, you know. Real companies. Place, real companies, yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, John insisted, as he has a way of doing it, and, and <laughs> we also sent the tapes to Sierra. Sierra came back about four or five weeks later with a chip which ended up being the, the working chip. And the other guys were well into the next year before they delivered chips to us. So Sierra saved our And so our uh, did you make, get the million and a half from Prime? So John Muceris, I think it was, or maybe Todd Bache, flew, flew back <clears throat> on Christmas Day, flights are cheaper, to, uh, <laughs> to <laughs> Natick Mass. And, right? yeah. and we delivered a, a working chip on a board to Prime you know, on December 26th. Except there's nobody at the company on December 26th because they were closed down. <laughs> <laughs> but luckily, put a tag on the door, we got the delivery done. This is a, the first spin of the silicon, and it worked. I remember yeah. the, the, it was a Saturday, the, yeah. as I recall it, when the chip came back from Sierra, and Danny Freitas took it in the back. He was, had a God. test rig, and he was going to see how it worked. And he wouldn't let anybody else in the room because he, he wanted it to work. You know? 
but we had a little PA system in the, in the company. And hours later, we're all just you know, sitting around, really not much to do on Saturday, but hours later on the PA, Dan said, one plus one equals two. <laughs> <laughs> and then 30 minutes later, two plus two equals four, and, and the chip worked. The chip worked. It was marvelous. Amazing. And uh, you, you had the money to pay, make payroll then, in January. Yeah, well, just barely. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, cash was a problem, and now you needed to become a real company uh, instead of just a technology development. And there was a feeling you needed to get a real CEO. So uh, uh, you went out recruiting, and uh, yep. Bob enters the picture. Yep. So I remember flying, um, flying almost around Christmas time, but the next year, flying back to, to Boston to meet Bob, and we're driving out to his house. He said, uh, we said, we'll take you out to dinner. And I think it was Bob's wife said, she had looked at our financials because she was a financial person. She said, they can't afford to take you out to dinner. I'll cook dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Bob's house was across the street from in Western Massachusetts, where I went to high school. So something was working. But anyway, we uh, got to meet Bob, and we somehow so convinced him. So pick it up at the dinner, Bob. What happened next? <clears throat> well, I'm hearing a lot of things for the first time. That's yeah. the first thing I'm going to say. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, I'm tell you everything. I felt I was uniquely qualified for this job because. I had, when I was responsible for the microprocessor strategy at IBM, convinced Frank Carey, who was then CEO, that the 801 project uh, was not ready to be put into a product for at least five years because of the lack of software. Then I was at Data General, MIPS, it turned out, had gotten a design win with our Austin, Texas facility, and when they brought me that, for approval, I disapproved it. I said, what are you doing? So you're really on board with risk now. I, right? I was totally committed <laughs> to risk. Yeah, right. And uh, so, but what, I, what happened was, I was coming to the West Coast for, for another reason, and I was so impressed with John and Skip, they said, why don't you just stop in and see us, see what we've done. You do understand risk, and you know what the issues are. We didn't offer him a plane ticket, though. <laughs> no, I had to pay for my own ticket. <laughs> Uh, but when I visited the company and I saw what they had in terms of this, that they had approached it very differently from anyone else. They approached it from the software side going down to the silicon. And everyone else had approached it from the silicon. The semiconductor guys, as you know, struggled with software all the time. And I knew one of the big challenges was the optimizing compilers. And when I asked John and Skip, well, what did you do to get out optimizing compilers? They said, Fred Chow. I said, what's a Fred Chow? <laughs> they said, oh, he's one of John's ex-graduate students. Well, the estimate in IBM to do the compilers was 400 man years. So if you ever want to believe in genius or a force multiplier or anything, that was Fred Chow. So uh, unfortunately for the company, everything they had shipped the previous year had come back in the first quarter. Um, so there was a problem in terms of the systems not doing what they were supposed to or other issues. A little negative revenue. But, but the potential was so huge and the team was so great. And that stood the test of time. The team was good. Um, we, as soon as I got there, I guess I started in April, um, we had an offsite meeting and we were burning a lot of cash <laughs> because this foundry thing really wasn't working. We were paying for parts if the yields were bad. We were, we were actually paying by the wafer. Nor were the foundries we were using uh, giving us state-of-the-art semiconductor technology. So we had an off-site meeting and I said, look, uh, and by that time I think we had shipped about 30 parts or 40 mm -hmm. parts, something like that. And I said, for us to be a success, you have to think 10 to the sixth. You're not gonna have a microprocessor that's broadly used if you can't get the economy of scales, things that Intel had learned 15 years before. Um, so I said, our goal has to be to come up with a strategy that can get 10 to the six. We knew we had a great technology. We, knew we had great software. And what we had to do was get a design win that would make us credible to the other semiconductor companies, the bigger semiconductor companies, 
And that design win really became digital. We got the digital design win, and Joe DiNucci was very influential in that. By that time, we had assembled a very good team of people. We had Chuck Bosenberg on board. Um, Joe was not on board. He was a digital. He was on board with us, but not with, with MIPS. <laughs> and Bill Job had come in as sales VP. Uh, I had worked with Bill at Data General. I knew how good he could be. And he, he had been wasting his time at some VC firm. And uh, a, a great talent going to waste. And I'll never forget the day he walked in my office and he said, I'm going to go get a design win at DEC. And I said, good luck. <laughs> I just didn't think it was possible. But that really put us on the map and enabled us to go have credibility when we talked to the NECs and the Toshibas. By that time, we had converted from a foundry to a licensing program and had licensed companies like LSI, Performance Semiconductor, IDT, to produce the chip, sell it themselves, and pay us a license fee. That also helped us to generate cash up front because we would sell, you know, the license fees even to that group was in the million to two million dollar range, plus we wanted a prepayment of royalties. So we completely moved away from the foundry model, moved to the licensing model. The semiconductor companies were now motivated because they had a product to sell and a product that had software. And we very quickly, uh, and guys like John Mashey, and had done great work on the performance measurements. And fortunately, our, our principal uh, competitor at Sun had decided to misstate their performance numbers. And so we took advantage of that. And with our open approach, we were able to begin attracting uh, real customers. You know, David's useful to say you know, what, what Bob really had to do with the team there was develop a business model. You, you have to put this in context. There are no fabulous semiconductor companies then, and there are no IP companies. Neither concept exists. And a, lot, a big part of the MIP story was figuring out how to take this technology and match it up to a business model that was not yet invented. And that's certainly what made everybody nervous. It's what made the VCs nervous. It's what made some of our customers nervous, even though the technology was so terrific. And, we, we went through a long, torturous path. Would have been easier to cut through it, but it wasn't so clear what the route to cut through it was at that time. So, uh, Joe, I know from the uh, earlier tapes that uh, the deck win was the big one, and that really uh, got you on the map. But then it was a design win game. And so tell us a little bit about what happened. <coughs> um, it was uh, an amazing experience. Um, I, I think the timing would be early 1987. Bob is newly with MIPS. They're sorting out, defining the model and so on, getting the license model working. Meantime, digital is sort of like the Hussein sons, you know, with the castles and the palaces and all the girlfriends and, you know, they're having a lot of fun and that's deck with 60% gross margin on Vax and what could be wrong? And I was running a workstation group for deck and we were finding that if the client was committed to VMS, things were fine, but if they weren't, like National Semiconductor, for instance, who had been a good, loyal customer, so, no, we're going to buy, we're going to run Unix. Well, you could run it on a Vax, well, you could, but uh, it's sort of like going shopping in a Lamborghini. It's a bit of overkill. Uh, also overpriced, I might point out. So that was the problem. And uh, some of the ninja in my group, Jim Billmeyer, Mike Nilsson, Mario Pagliaro, hooked up with some other crazies like John Mashey and uh, Larry Weber and Skipster and started talking about stuff. And... Skip showed up with what was purported to be a, a prototype of a single board computer with an R2000. Um, it was a prototype like a fourth grader would take the show and tell, I guess, but it got us really excited about what it could be, if only. And it gave, it gave us a way to get into deck and say, you know what, there could be a different business model for the Unix business. It doesn't have to demolish the pricing and the 60% margin on the VAX. Let's build a different product line. What a great idea. Everybody thought that was a great idea, except all the people that were booking on the status quo, which was most everybody in the company. So I came to learn that revolutionaries get shot in the chest. I think Bob Miller told me that the first time, and he was absolutely right. Uh, but it was very exciting. I learned that at IBM. Right. 
there was some brilliant engineering done, Mike Nielsen and um, Carol Peters, people like that, that worked with us at DEC in uh, Palo Alto, working with the MIPS people. But it was really, really a wild time. And uh, digital had a well-deserved reputation for unbreakable products. They, um, in fact, I'll bet some of those old vaxes are still being supported by HP over in <laughs> Europe. <laughs> um, they just don't break. I mean, they're like Toyota pickup trucks. And we were kind of in a, a dead run to get that product out. And it went from green light, go ahead and build it, to product launch in January 1989 in less than nine months. It was just phenomenal. And the epilogue is that um, uh, that product line sold over $2 billion in its first two years. And it's really scary to think about what might have been if digital had put all of its, to still stop McNeely's line, all of its wood behind that arrowhead, there probably would have never been a son. Uh, DEC would have owned it because it had very loyal customers, but it didn't. It, 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 there was a lot of sabotage around applications especially. And the A team was always working on the VMS stuff. And, you know, we got the sort of outward bound guys and so on. So DEC was a, it was a tough sell. I, I have to paraphrase the Yoda. As you know, the Yoda said, um, the, do or do not, there is no try. And at DEC it was build or build not, there is no buy. There was no buying anything at DEC. <laughs> so, uh, but it was very exciting and um, it did end up with uh, Jim Belmar and I both joining MIPS then in uh, spring of 89, which was uh, awesome quite a ride. Dave, there's, there's another customer, and actually before DEC that we should mention, because it's really yep. important to the story, and that's SGI. Certainly. Now, we knew Jim and his team, and you know, John had worked with them, I had worked with them before we started MIPS. Um, and they needed to move from 68,000 to the next generation, and we, we pitched them and we worked closely with them <laughs> and everything. And, and then um, one day, I don't know what the date is, but Jim Clark called John Maceros and said, we're going with uh, Fairchild Clipper. You're out. And John said, Jim, I just need one more meeting. Give me one more chance. He got the team together, and he took everybody over to SGI. Probably was a Saturday again, and turned that around. Got SGI back on MIPS, and that you know matters to the rest of the story here. Then uh, it was an architecture war, and you picked up a number of other customers in the next year or so, didn't you? Yeah, lots of customers. Joe can tell you about customers, and and just to continue the semiconductor strategy, we, um, we had a bunch of very great partners that were little guys, IDT and, and, and others, um, local, domestic, small partners. We did go to Intel, Motorola, TI, to the large American companies, and we had interesting negotiations and road contracts and got right to the verge of signing some of those big companies, but never got it to happen. We, we, we had a policy that if you licensed our processor, because it really took is this whole concept of a lot of resource and dedication and you couldn't confuse your sales force, if, if you got a MIPS license, you couldn't sell another risk microprocessor. And we really re enforced that. Texas Instruments, Motorola, a number of other companies wanted a license and we wouldn't sell it because they wouldn't give up the spark. They, they were trying to hedge their bets. And I said, no, um, you have to believe in this because otherwise your sales force won't know what to sell. And so what we did get to do, John and I started going to Japan. And we would visit the advanced technology labs at NEC and Toshiba and stuff like that and um, started working on them and they were more open to this idea and less likely to have their own risk designs. I remember meeting with Bob Miller, John Hennessy, and myself, and Taki Yamamoto probably was in the meeting too. With Dr. Sasaki was the head of the NEC semiconductor group. And we gave our pitch to him and we showed him you know, our little, little uh, chip die and everything. And he just he got on the phone and he called in his, his chief guy who brought in, uh, it was about an inch on a side, is it? Uh, it was going to be their 486 killer. This is before the 486 was out, the V series, something or other. Right? And he said, Why do we need your little chip? I've got this great big chip. <laughs> <laughs> but, but within six or nine months, they were on. There was a new series called NEC VR series, mm -hmm. MIP Space, and they were, they were in our camp. So we got Toshiba, and we got Sony, and we got Sumitomo. That, that big chunk of silicon was going to do 10 MIPS. They told them if they gave us a piece of silicon that size, we'd give them 100 MIPS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So uh, the design wins. Now things are going very well. You got Tandem, you got Rome, you got Bowl, you got CDC, you got Nixdorf, you got Siemens, uh, you got Sumitomo. Uh, design wins are happening everywhere. And yet the software issues in the Unix world and incompatibility is a problem. So Bob, uh, that gives birth to uh, ACE, Advanced <coughs> Computing Environment or whatever right. it was. Right, Advanced Computing Environment. Uh, well, the, the good news and the bad news about the MIPS processor was that it's supported by Endian. And our customer base, two of the most powerful companies that we were working with, Digital and Microsoft, were Little Endian. <laughs> and all the guys who were Unix System 5 big were Big Endian. And um, <clears throat> we knew the, the big advantage Sun had is at that time Sun owned Unix. They owned the API. They had a huge application set. And the software guys were, were not going to continue to have labs full of equipment where they would certify each of their you know, applications on a tandem or a digital or whatever that we had to get to an API so that we could leverage a common API and, and be able to tell the software companies. Our first attempt at that was we try to create our own internal software company that would go out and do that for the MIPS architecture and we would, we would provide platforms. Uh, but it, it turned out to be what I used to call a green mail where the software companies say, oh yeah, we'll be happy to pour it, just give us a million dollars. and We couldn't afford that. So we created the ACE Consortium and worked toward achieving an API. Um, and eventually, and certainly to this day, with the help of Silicon Graphics, which was the driving force for Big Endian, we did accumulate a lot of applications for the architecture. And, and the whole key, and, and, and I, John and I was mentioning this on our call the other day, history continues to repeat itself, mm -hmm. that you need the software equos ecosystem, whether it's your workstation, your microprocessor, or your cloud platform. And I'm watching the cloud guys go through that today. Is they're all trying to recruit applications into their clouds because they know that's where the value is. And it and sort of happened on the other end in cell phones with uh, Apple iPhone right. applications. Right. Right. So Android copied the ACE initiative right. away and created some APIs. I, I think the inter there's an case. interesting lesson here. I think a lot of us and a lot of people in the industry in the late 80s, mid to late 80s, thought high-level languages, standardized operating system, right? Unix, high-level languages, this is going to solve the software problem because it'll make it easy to port. And what we didn't count on was the giant rise in very complex, very sophisticated shrink wrap software. That meant you had to go pay somebody a million dollars to do a port to your system. And by the way, you had to pay them every few years if you wanted to update it and maintain. And that, I think, was a big lesson for everybody and gets back to Bob's point, the importance of software. And you see it now, Dave, I think you're exactly right about Android and Apple OS and things like that. It's the right. same thing playing out. It, I mean, uh, the one the lesson this industry should know inside and out by now is uh, Providing the application developers a consistent interface, making their lives easier, is a big win for everyone. And the more complicated you make that job, the less likely. I mean, you also had the problem that even if you did pay your million dollars, we're all businessmen. If I'm selling $100 million of my application on platform A, and 20 million on platform B, even though you paid me a million dollars, A is going to get the priority. And therefore, even though you got it to have one instantiation of that software on platform B, you're always going to be the last in a release cycle. So the customer is going to be told, if you want the latest version of that application, buy platform A. Yep. And that's a very hard thing to overcome. So. Uh uh, Microsoft has uh, got a new operating system, NT, and they're uh, putting it up on uh, Intel's latest processor, the 486, <laughs> and Intel's 860. Uh, one day, Gates calls me up and tells me he's not going to do the 860 anymore. He's doing MIPS. Tell me about that. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> actually, I give Sorry, John Dave. most of the credit for that because we had a meeting with Bill Gates and uh, to, to try to convince him that the 860 was a rock, which it turned out to be, and, <laughs> and, and that we rolled. 
<laughs> it's a good being, graphics co-processor. Be, a graphics good co graphics That's co-processor. What yeah. Bill, if what you're looking for is a good graphics co-processor, this is your chip. <laughs> anyway, uh, and we had Dave Cutler on our side, even though he had, he had led the loyal opposition at DEC, but had become a believer. And John had convinced Bill Gates, I sat in the meeting and watched it happen. And he walked out of that meeting, and two months later, we had the agreement to put NT, which was the first time ever micro, uh, Microsoft had put an operating system on anything but an x86 architecture. The reason Bill Gates came to that meeting is kind of cool, where it was a Saturday, and I had written a letter to John Shirley, who was then president of Microsoft, and I said, I understand you're developing portable OS 2 on the i860. That's not the best idea. Um, there's two reasons why the MIPS chip is a better idea. <laughs> one was a business reason, one was a technical reason. And two, about a week later, we got a letter from Nate, Nathan Marvall, 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 Marvall. Marvall, Bill's techno guru, said, come on up and let's talk this over. So yeah. Skip and I went up on a Saturday. Nathan consumed three Diet Cokes per hour for the five hours we were there. Nathan. For five Lined up the hours. logos. But that led to a very, very high bandwidth conversation between Microsoft and MIPS, which led to Bill coming to the old MIPS place on Arquez and for a sit down with, Bob, with John. My reward for getting that meeting to happen was I got to sit in the meeting if I promised not to say a word. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> so MIPS is now pretty much on top of the world. You got Microsoft behind you. You're developing the next generation of their operating system on your architecture. You've got lots of sources of semiconductors. You've got a lot of design wins across the company. The 3000 is done and you start the next generation, the 4000. Tell us about that, John. So we started the 4000, I thought, from the beginning, we thought it was time to try to exploit more instruction level parallelism. So we chose to go with a, what, w what was then called a super pipeline, but a very deep pipeline, get more instructions in flight. We decided to go to 64-bit architecture, and I think we came up with a clever scheme to extend the architecture so that a minimal number of instructions could be added, and you could just run quite naturally in 64-bit mode not worrying about the fact that, or in 32-bit mode without having to switch back and forth. And I think that was an important idea. We made one mistake along the way. We got uh, distracted by a little engagement with ECL that um, <laughs> turned, out to, turned out to cost the company a lot of time and Our effort. Did generate some revenue, but what it really harmed was it meant that it slowed down the 4,000 development. And had we just stuck to CMOS and put the bet there, we would have been much further ahead of Alpha. Right. Deck alpha. Would have, it, the switch would have been impossible. Alpha introduction would have been so far behind where we were, at least as a Unix product, probably. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that, that was a mistake along the way. It helped in other ways. It got us some revenue and things like that. But it turned out that after the company got bought by SGI, the fact that the R4000 was a 64-bit processor and was shifting around 64-bit data made it the ideal thing to build the, uh, what became the Nintendo graphics chipset and the That's partner right. of the Nintendo graphics chipset. So we paired SGI's graphics expertise with MIPS processor expertise. And of course, that turned into a giant business and really launched the company into the embedded space, which was critical because the, trying to be a standalone company in just the processor space, um, given the fracturing that occurred eventually between the risk markets and the Unix market, wouldn't have worked. So it really was a launching platform to really go in the embedded Nintendo, space yeah. in a big way, and that was critical in the long term. You know, I tell people, the idea for the embedded processor really came from John Scully. Uh, he gave us a set of specs for what he wanted for the Newton. And we looked at that and we said, hey, this is pretty cool. You know, you can build this small chip, very low cost, very low power. And we knew we could do it. And I think having done that and then married it with the SGI graphics, um, as we like to say, it, it's hard to go through a day without touching something that doesn't have a MIPS processor in it. So uh, in 86, the R2000, 88, the R3000. R4000 was supposed to come out in 90, but it came out in 91, so it was a year behind schedule. Right. Yep. 92, SGI acquires MIPS. How did that happen, Bob? Well, I think SGI got very worried. I, I always said that microprocessor development is the sport of kings. And the next 
processor after the R4000 was going to be the R10000. And when we sized the development costs on the R10000, it was clear it was going to be very hard to fund that um, without impacting the P&L very negatively. I mean, we didn't have enough revenue, even though we were at about a $200 million a year rate. If you say a normal 10% of revenue goes to R&D, it wasn't going to be enough to fund the R10,000. So we had two choices. One was try to get the money from the partners, like NEC and Toshiba, which we eventually did very successfully, but it cost time. And the other was to SGI uh, really wanted to acquire the company to make sure that, that their microprocessor investment would be preserved and that they could continue to, to develop new generations. And of course, the big concern was Intel breathing down our necks mm -hmm. in terms of, and, and again, mm -hmm. you, you kind of try to take your competition seriously, but uh, the, the way we were succeeding was by always being two times Intel. So whatever Intel, if you took a snapshot at any given <coughs> point in time, our goal was always to be two times better, which in those days was enough to do it. But we had to maintain that margin. So uh, the acquisition happens in the 92, and then the company is part of SGI, comes out with the R8000 in 94, the R10000 in 98, and eventually winds up getting spun out again. So. Skip, you want to uh, sort of comment on? Uh, well, it's interesting, MIPS you know. So, so MIPS um, had its second IPO. I don't know what the record is, but it's pretty good. Um, <laughs> and uh, as Bob said, there's a MIPS chip in everything you use. There's one in you know in your wireless router and in your printer and probably your TV and your set-top box, and they're all over the place. And Cisco routers, et cetera, et cetera. So, and uh, MIPS technology is still going. Thanks to them for sponsoring this event. About. I understand 500 million chips a year are shipped. There's hundreds of licensees. You got and your 10 to the 6th. There's 10 to the 6th and it. a little more. I, I, I exceeded it. Well, uh, 10 to the 9th is and in what, the goal. What, 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 <laughs> what's interesting is, you know, everything else falls away in the, in the systems business and SGI or whatever, all those things helped. But it's the original business model that Bob taught us. Now it's called IP licensing around a, a core architecture with strict control over the architecture. And yeah. that's what they're doing today. And the core architecture, I mean, how many architectures last for 30 years? Very hard to find them. So let me ask the first question. Uh, 1990, uh, you're absolutely on top of the world. The Wall Street Journal and Business Week and all the popular publications are, and all the analysts are saying, Cisco is dead, the risk versus Cis war is over. Uh, you and Spark, the, the Sun guys, have won. Yet today, uh, the great majority of the revenue and profits are not from the risk side. They're from the Intel side. So what happened? Well, so you write the question. Nobody told me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, we I talked mean, about this. It's very simple. Uh, it's very simple. Eventually, it got to be the case that the overhead of translating from x86 instruction sets to a simple instruction set, which is then cracked by the back end, which was first done at DEC in the 8500, but then all the Intel processors do this now, and then just pipelining the back end like a risk machine. That extra overhead became negligible as we started building gigantic caches and all kinds of other things on the chip. So the overhead became negligible. Now, we're seeing a reemergence of the overhead. Look at the power performance effectiveness of an x86 architecture against a MIPS or an ARM architecture. Power performance, which really matters in the portable workspace, you, and the difference is today gigantic. Bigger than two. It's actually bigger than it was in the risk days. Now, will that, be a, will, will that eventually disappear or will that play out? We'll see. Technology has new uh, things ahead of us, I think. Several people ask questions about the really difference today between risk and SIS, saying that the risk machines have gotten more complex and the sys machines have adopted risk technology. Is there really a risk sys? How would you de define risk today? It, it, it's, about, it's about, you have to look at the architecture level because who cares what happens underneath the architecture? Right. I mean, the smart people will design the best way they can think to execute those instructions fast, right? And they, and they will. If anything, we've backed off from the most complicated architectural techniques and we're moving to multi-core, right? And as somebody pointed out, 
It's gotten too hard for the hardware designers, so we're going to force the software people to solve the problem. Because we don't have any more good hardware ideas. And that's the truth. And the instruction level parallelism model, which was the basis of performance from the mid 80s till about 2000, lasted us 15 years. Right? Now we have to find a different way to do it, and it's going to mean much more software involvement. And for better or worse, the industry has not made the investment on figuring out how to crack the software problem. So we're now 10 years behind of where we need to be on software, and we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Hmm. So today there's two very interesting models. The MIPS model and the, and the uh, ARM model are intellectual property licensing models. And I would guess that if you looked at the number of processors in the world, uh, the, clearly those IP licensed architectures uh, are skyrocketing in terms of, of numbers. And, Wall Street and analysts are now writing about you know, Intel and its future and mobile platforms and the fact that uh, ARM seems to be very heavily used there, although you pointed out there's a lot of MIPS embedded processors around. Uh, but in that model, ARM seems to be uh, ahead in numbers today. What would MIPS had, had, would have had to do to be where ARM is today? We made a mistake. We you would have had to make a mistake. No, we did make a mistake. Oh. We didn't realize how important the cell phone market was. Early on, there was no money to be made. You couldn't really make any money in that business. But ARM got it by investing in it. They did it. It was a very smart move. And it turned out to be an incredible leverage point. Yeah. And, there, and there'll be. So that, and that was, we just looked at the gross margin and said, that's not, an inve that's not a great return. We'd be better off putting our attention elsewhere. But of course, it turned out. Cell phones became smartphones, became a gigantic one. Right. right. And, be, and are that, becoming computers. And, yeah. <laughs> and that battle and that was get a, fought again. See, the thing is, if there's one thing you can take away from this, is this is an industry where there is a major sea change every 10 years, whether you like it or not. You know, flip phones, arm one. Now it's all about smartphones. We all know smartphones are converging to be the device where you do everything. Whether it's your banking, getting on an airplane, doesn't matter. It's, it's all going to be done from a smartphone. So this, this battle will get fought again. And the advantage of the MIPS licensing model that we put in place, whatever it was, 20 years ago, is we allowed the semiconductor manufacturers or the smartphone manufacturers or any manufacturer to add value. It wasn't a license that says, here's a design, you take it, you have to use it this way. It was a design that says, as long as you pay us your royalty, you go to it. And that will win in the end. And the smartphone, as the smartphones get more complex, and as John said, as software becomes a bigger part of the equation. I mean, the cell phone of eight years ago didn't have a lot of software in it. It's not what you would say, but I saw people com complaining the open, or, or maintaining the open stack for the, for the cloud is comparable to what Android is doing for smartphones. <laughs> well, that kind of gives you a relative measure of how much software is on an Android. And, and that's where our, the, the whole licensing concept of what we called open at the time, but the reality is it open means a lot of people can contribute. You're not just narrowing it down to a small 100-man team or 200-man team. It means thousands, whether at Stanford University or Carnegie Tech. Are they still Carnegie Tech? No. I can, <laughs> <laughs> they, did they, can, they can all contribute. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, the cost of developing the uh, next generation MIPS processor was overwhelming. Yet uh, companies with huge resources, IBM, Hewlett-Packard, digital equipment, all had their own risk processor developments. And by and large, uh, those efforts have not succeeded. Why? Well, because they didn't open them up. <clears throat> they all look to them to be proprietary, proprietary. advantage. And if you, if you do that, your market, your potential market, is your own customer base. You don't get to 10 to the sixth. Mm -hmm. Sun never got to 10 to the sixth. And I can remember having a conversation when I was on the board of SGI uh, with the then CEO saying, unless you can think about the fact that you can beat Sun by an order of magnitude, you ought to get out of the workstation business. 
Well, what I was obviously thinking was somehow you have to create a product that leverages your graphics with a Microsoft operating system and sell five million of these things. But they were still, and, and this is what happened with all those companies, it was about preserving gross margins, Dave. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't allow my 60% yeah. gross margin to slip yeah. away. Right. So I'm gonna maintain pri proprietary advantage and I'm gonna maintain my gross margin. And guess what? They're all gone. There isn't one of those companies around today. Every company that try to do that is gone. Right. And the reality is, if you have to sacrifice your gross margin to get volume and a bigger customer base, that's the way to go. Yep. So um, we haven't seen many new instruction sets lately. Is there an opportunity for another instruction set sometime in the future, John? You know, I think right now the problem, Dave, is that um, we don't know what would go in that architecture because we haven't made the investment in software. And when we did the risk work, we had C compilers, we had Unix, we had applications, right? We could run them, we could analyze them, we could figure out. We don't yet have a good grip on what our application's gonna look like on a, on a multi-processor desktop, on a next generation smartphone, on an iPad, next generation iPad, or in the cloud. We've gotta get those applications, we've gotta study them, we've gotta think about what the architecture looks like, and then we have to say, all right, how much do we need to change in order to make that kind of environment? And we simply don't know. Once we figure that out, then we can think about lots of ideas. There are lots of ideas floating out there, but most of them haven't made it into the mainstream because there's not enough evidence they work in, in real software. So that's what we gotta do. It's gonna take a while. So you guys are all uh, innovators and successful innovators. What's the next big thing? <laughs> well, my own personal Classics. belief is the next big thing is, is around healthcare. That that's really a huge opportunity to pull together a lot of disparate systems. There's, you know, the, uh, I can't remember, I guess it was, uh, he was never part of MIPS. In fact, he was at Sun, but we worked there a long time. as Ed Frank, who always used to say, follow the money. Well, in spite of all the machinations in Washington, there's going to be tons of money in healthcare. And, and whether it's iPad 2s or cell phone or smartphones, ways of tying together things that are important in healthcare that are going to reduce costs, improve care, improve the quality of care, I personally think is, is, is going to be the next big thing. Anybody else? I think it's going to be computers replacing people doing tasks that computers can do better. Driving your car for lots of people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Certainly room for improvement there. Especially, you know, yeah. all of us are getting older. We're all thinking about this, right? Uh, Speak for yourself. <laughs> yeah. You know, he used to be in a seminary. He's actually a priest in disguise. That's another story. Uh, you know, you know, these systems that land themselves on airplanes are actually better than human pilots. I mean, there are a lot of things where we actually, computers are now getting good enough that we can actually do better than people. Remembering people's names once you get to be 50. Computers <laughs> are much better. <laughs> so so I think we're going to see a lot more of that kind of thing. And we've got to see a breakthrough in terms of the interface between people and computers. You know, I don't really have anything that's a lot better than when I first sat down in front of the Xerox Alto. It's a little faster. It's got color rather than black and white. But you know what? It's a mouse, bitmap graphics, screen, windows. We need some kind of breakthrough in terms of the way we interface with computers. And by the way, it's probably going to come from the psychologists and people like that as much as it comes from the computer guys. But we need it. So uh, DARPA played a, a role in the initial work on uh, risk. What was that? They funded it. I mean, they were, you know, what DARPA did, DARPA probably more than any other part of the federal investment saved the American computer industry because it was their investment that created me, Conway, that created the Software Foundry, created lots of companies and got that started and, and created the early MIPS VLSI projects. But if you look at all the stuff that spun out of those original investments, modern CAD tools all came out of that investment. 
the kind of the concept of a software foundry and eventually fabulous semiconductor, right? The revolution in risk. I mean, they made Unix. They were the ones that made Unix into something that really could be an open operating system. Ethernet. 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 Right. Well, uh, Ethernet was at well, Xerox well, Park before Xerox that. Park started. But, yeah, before that. So uh, is, Sun is, Microsystems. I mean, lots of things. Is the government making those kinds of investments today? I hope they keep making them because if they don't make them. Um, the university will be in trouble. <laughs> well, well, the university will be in trouble, but if you look at the government's role of making those long-term investments in things that are far out, remember that Google came from a research project funded by the National Science Foundation to explore how to build digital libraries. Didn't have anything to do with searching the web. Came out of something different. That kind of serendipity of putting people together, pushing them in terms of thinking outside the box, and then seeing what comes out of it, I think, continues to work well. And it's one of the reasons that this country has the best working environment between universities and industry. And one of the reasons we've been so successful in this area. Well, the government certainly invests and has for a long time in the medical area in terms of medical development and advancement. That's an established model. But is it happening in the computer area in a way that will generate the kind of advances that we saw in the era of MIPS? I'm hoping it will, Dave. I think they got um, distracted a bit with short-term investments. The government is not a good short-term investor in research because they get too close to development. They start trying to pick winners and losers. and mm -hmm. They're much better standing back and trying to invest on the thing that's outside the box. If you look at, as a country, how much we invest in medical research and what we get in terms of economic return for that, investing in IT and semiconductor research is at least 10 times more effective for the government in terms oh. of return to the country because we get solid return from that and you can demonstrate it. I think maybe they should have a business model that looks at payback. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we're working on it. We're trying to get them to think that way. Okay, and uh, any last closing statements? Thank you all for coming during your lunch break. We appreciate no, no. it. Okay, no. <laughs> and, uh, Thank you very much. The question has been asked, how, raise your hand if you ever worked at MIPS. That's excellent. Oh, wow, excellent. that's great. Yeah. Thanks again, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Great.